Hello and welcome to this free coaching session from the PM Study Coach. I'm Cornelius Fichtner and I am your coach. Thanks for your interest in our PMP exam coaching course. This free video will allow you to experience what your 14 coaching sessions in the course are going to be like. It is the full length session and contains many study tips and recommendations that will help you on your road to becoming PMP certified. The complete PM Study Coach has 14 coaching sessions just like this one here. Every week for the duration of the 10-week coaching, you will receive a new session. That's a total of over 11 hours of coaching videos. And as part of the course, you will also receive additional assignments to study, read articles, listen to podcasts and watch additional videos. In that way, you know exactly what to do day after day, week after week as you're preparing for your exam. And of course, you can copy your course onto your phone or tablet so that you can study anywhere you go. You can find all the details about the course and how it will act as your GPS to the PMP exam at pmstudycoach.com. And now, on with the show. Welcome to the PM Study Coach, your guide to the PMP exam. Here's your coach... Cornelius Fichtner. Welcome back to the PM Study Coach. This is our session on project scope management and I'm your coach Cornelius Fichtner. We start out this session with a brief introduction on today's topic project scope management. Then we go through an overview of the project scope management knowledge area followed by the discussion of the six processes so that you have a basic understanding of what they are all about. I'll also go through the essential essentials with you, the stuff that you really, really need to master for the PMP exam. We then do a review and go over some of the points again that we have discussed and even go through a couple of questions and answers on project scope management. And then, of course, before we conclude this lesson, I will leave you with some take action items, some very useful material to enhance your studies and, of course, our self-assessment to the test that will give you a chance to tackle a few questions on your own to check your knowledge and understanding of this knowledge area. And even though this is session five on project scope management, let me remind you again that yes, we have advised you to study chapters five to 13 first before you go back to chapter four about integration. One image that you can put in your mind here is that of an orchestra. Chapter four, project integration management is the conductor. But before we can do the work of the conductor, we have to read about the musical score, we have to get to know our instruments and the musicians, and once we have all that information, then we can begin conducting the orchestra to play the music. And for the PMP exam, this means that we must first learn about the other nine knowledge areas, starting here with project scope management, before we can move back to integration. So without further delay, let's get familiar with the musical score for scope. So here we are in session five of your journey to becoming a PMP. And so far you've been introduced to the PMBOK guide and a lot of general but very important information about the PMP exam. So let me introduce you to the pattern of how we will be doing things going forward. Here in the PM Study Coach, our approach is on coaching. We won't give you all the details on scope management in this session, but we'll provide you with the roadmap for your studies. And then I also want to point out that the PMBOK guide has a consistent outline that it follows. It first introduces you to the knowledge area and then covers each process in turn. For each process, it describes each of the ITTOs, the inputs, tools, techniques and outputs in detail and explains the interrelationships among different processes. We'll be doing 
pretty much the same thing and give you the high level overview here in the study coach so for your studies use the framework that the study coach and the PIMBOK guide provide you to anchor your understanding there is no need to create a new study framework yourself just follow along nevertheless i still want you to establish a structure you have started your journey to becoming a PMP. You should have your materials and have read some PIMBOK guide chapters. You may have set aside a time each day to devote to your studies. If not, this is a good time to establish such a structure, a routine that you can stick to and that works well with other elements of your family life, work and any other commitments or activities that you enjoy. What is a good routine? What is a good structure? You may ask. Well, this may be different for every student. For some, first things in the morning is a good time when they are most alert and able to absorb information. Others are night owls and prefer studying at the end of the day. There are some aspects that work well for all. For example, you should create an environment or routine that is free of distractions so that you can concentrate on the material at hand. The important thing is that you find a study location and study routine that works for you. And don't be discouraged if your first attempt in doing this and finding a location and a routine isn't exactly what you envisioned. It's perfectly acceptable to adjust your routine as you go along. What is critical is that you find the approach that works best for you. When you are mastering the topics under project scope management and for that matter under every knowledge area, my recommendation is this. You should study one process chapter every day. So today start studying the introduction and then chapter 5.1 plan scope management. Tomorrow move on to 5.2 collect requirements and so on. And yes, once you are done reading a particular chapter in the PIMBOK guide, you will then open Open up your separate PMP exam preparation book and look for the corresponding chapter in there. This will give you another angle on the same information and oftentimes it will also help clear up any questions that you may have. Of course, if you also have the project management prep cast, you can also watch the appropriate lesson from there. So these are the two primary activities that you will follow in your study routine. This will be consistent throughout out all the future sessions. The PIMBOK guide says that project scope management includes the processes required to ensure that the project includes all the work required and only the work required to complete the project successfully. And to translate, this means that project scope management is concerned with defining and controlling exactly what service, product or result the project will and what it won't deliver. And that begins with planning, as you will see in the first section 5.1 plan scope management. Stick to the plan is always good advice and it's especially important for a project manager. If you have a well thought out plan and use it to guide you through the project, you will get the results you'll want and end up with a very satisfied customer. Project scope management ensures that you have not wasted any time or effort on your project. When you lay out the scope of the project, you ensure that everything the project requires is accomplished and not not one thing more. Your team will know exactly what needs to be done. And note that when you study the individual chapters, you will learn that the PIMBOK guide distinguishes between product scope and project scope. You must understand the differences between these two concepts. There are six processes in project scope management and not surprisingly, the first four processes are all about planning. Plan scope management. This is the process of creating a scope management plan that documents how the project scope will be defined, validated and controlled. This is where we plan and document how we ensure delivery of a product, service or result that meets the expectations of the customer. The two key documents we create are the scope management plan and the requirements management plan. 
then we have collect requirements. This is the process of determining, documenting and managing stakeholder needs and requirements to meet the project objectives. Customers often believe that they know exactly what they want until you ask them to define it. And one of the biggest issues with scope is that your stakeholders will always have some assumptions that seem perfectly logical and obvious to them. They expect you to be a mind reader and just somehow know these implicit assumptions and requirements. But here is the good news. For the PMP exam, as long as your project delivers exactly what was originally specified and documented, then the project is considered successful. Then we move on to the process of define scope. This is the process of developing a detailed description of the project and the product. Define scope aims to provide a detailed description of the project and product. Think of it as your microscope, showing you all the details of the finished project and final product. You'll be making use of a number of tools and techniques here, consulting professionals in their fields, including the stakeholders, industry groups, technical associations and subject matter experts. You will end up with a project scope statement that shows explicit exclusions that have been agreed upon by the stakeholders. This manages expectations by limiting scope to the possible and ensures stakeholder satisfaction. Then we move on to create WBS. This is the process of subdividing project deliverables and project work into smaller, more manageable components. By applying decomposition to your scope, you will break up the work into manageable pieces and then document the result in the work breakdown structure, the WBS. Any project, even a kindergarten finger painting activity, must be broken down into manageable sequences in order to prevent it from descending into chaos. We call these manageable sequences work packages. You'll refer to the project scope statement to optimize your WBS process. By attacking the project through work packages, everyone stays organized and the workload is manageable. Oh, and while we are talking about project deliverables here, let me throw in the following project management proverb for you. Correct deliverables on the wrong project are just as wrong as the wrong deliverables on the right projects. I think that if you can avoid this on any of your projects, then your career as a project manager will be a success. And so we are moving on to the last two processes here in project scope management. They're both about monitoring and controlling. The first one, validate scope. This is the process of formalizing acceptance of the completed project deliverables. You review the deliverables with the client to be sure that they are satisfied and will formally accept the deliverables. You will inspect the deliverables before presenting them by measuring, examining and validating that they meet all requirements. This inspection is also referred to as a review, a product review, audits or walkthroughs. Once the client formally signs off, you forward the documents to the close project or phase process. If there are issues of non-acceptance, you will be dealing with change requests for defect repair or alterations. And then finally, control scope. This is the process of monitoring the status of the project and product scope and managing changes to the scope baseline. This last process of project scope management monitors project status and changes to the scope baseline. It also manages changes when they occur. You may have heard the term scope creep. Scope creep happens when you have uncontrolled changes that can wreak havoc on an otherwise well-planned project. Your scope baseline provides a tool to compare the actual results of your work and determine if some preventative or corrective action is needed. Control scope includes analyzing scope performance, reviewing change requests according to the Perform Integrated Change Control process and updating the project management plan and other project documents. In other words, control scope helps you manage the processes you're utilizing in such a way as to keep the project running smoothly. 
For today's Essential Essentials, we are going to go and take a look at the following. First of all, some key concepts, including the most important ones you should know for the PMP exam, and that is the WBS, Decomposition and Understanding Constraints. Then you should also know about the different scope management related documents as well as tools and techniques used in the different project scope management processes. Before we start to discuss some of the key concepts, let me go through a few more pointers on project scope. Project scope management lays the planning foundation uh, through the four planning processes. This is where we define how the project scope will be defined, validated and controlled. Here we produce the scope statement that often contains scope description. We have acceptance criteria in there, deliverables, constraints and assumptions. We also create the WBS, the work breakdown structure, as well as the WBS dictionary. These three items, the scope statement, the WBS and the WBS dictionary, they make up our scope baseline. One important fact to remember, and I mentioned this a few slides back in scope management, is that according to PMI, you only need to deliver the scope that was agreed upon. So if what you deliver matches the documented requirements, then you have successfully completed your project. So the project scope is really the primary focus of your project. Scope is the basis for describing the necessary work to complete, and your scope management plan defines how the the project scope will be defined, developed and verified, as well as how the work breakdown structure will be created and defined. It also provides guidance on how the project scope will be managed and controlled by the project management team. The plan helps the project team consider everything that may affect the project scope. To properly and completely define your project scope, the project manager and the project team must have a clear understanding of the work and the scope. They must have a clear vision of the project. They must understand the business need or have appropriate subject matter experts available who do. They must discover and document all stakeholder expectations in regards to scope. Documentation is key. The deliverables, requirements and acceptance criteria should be clearly and precisely documented to avoid any future misunderstandings. Acceptance of these documents is usually done through a sign-off. And once the scope has been described and defined, documented and approved by the project stakeholders, then all desired changes must be documented and we must follow the change control procedures that are also defined in the scope management plan. A very important tool that you will come across in the coming days is the WBS, the Work Breakdown Structure. Simply put, the WBS is a list of all the work to be executed by the project team to accomplish the project objectives and to create the required deliverables. It is so important, in fact, that it has its own process. This is because everything, and I mean absolutely every last piece of work on your project must be defined in the WBS. This is what is known as the 100% rule. If it isn't in the WBS, then you don't have to deliver it. But if it is in the WBS, well, then you better do deliver it. If you have never created a WBS yourself, then I strongly recommend that you create one for your current project. So once you have gone through this chapter in the PIMBOK guide, take a look at a few examples of WBSs and then create one for your own project. You will be amazed at how much clearer things will be once you have the WBS in front of you. Personally, I also like to use the WBS for communication with my stakeholders. If you show them a WBS as a graphical overview, then they can suddenly see the project as a whole. It's both a great management tool as well as a great communications tool. One question that I received from one of my students was this. Simple question. What is the difference between the work breakdown structure and decomposition? Well, the answer is actually quite simple. The WBS is a result. It is an output of the create WBS process where you apply decomposition as the tool. 
Decomposition and the WBS go hand in hand because you need to perform decomposition in order to create a WBS. On the other hand, obviously, decomposition is a tool, it is a technique. We use it to break down the work that we have into smaller, more manageable components and then we document the result as a WBS. Here are once again some of the key concepts when it comes to the WBS. So you have to know the WBS, you have to know what decomposition means, and you also have to understand what you will have in the WBS dictionary. It houses the details that are associated with the work packages and the control accounts. The level of detail needed in the WBS dictionary will be defined by the project team. Then, of course, you have to understand the 100% rule, meaning that everything has to be in the WBS. And then you also need to know some other BS, some other breakdown structures like the organizational breakdown structure, the risk breakdown structure, the resource breakdown structure, and also the bill of materials. And of course, you also have to understand what a work package is. A work package is an item that is at the lowest level of a WBS. Cost estimates are made at this level. And then, of course, you also need to understand the differences between related concepts like collect requirements and define scope. Here it's important to understand the difference between a requirement and scope. Uh, requirement. This is a condition or capability that must be met or possessed by a system, product, service or result or a component to satisfy a, a contract, a standard, a specification or other formally imposed documents. Requirements include the quantified and documented needs, wants, expectations of the sponsor, uh, customer or other stakeholders. An example would be, I want to travel from New York to Los Angeles in two hours. I don't care how you do it, just get me there in two hours. Then the scope. This is the sum of the product, service and results that is to be provided as a project. And then of course the project scope. This is the work that must be performed to deliver a product, service or result with the specified features and functions. As an example, let's build a very fast airplane or let's build a rocket to fly our customer from New York to Los Angeles in just two hours. And here are two related concepts that always confuse people. We have accepted deliverables and verified deliverables. Accepted deliverables are those deliverables that have been accepted through the validate scope process. And the verified deliverables, these are the ones that have been completed and checked for correctness by the control quality process. And if we take a look at these two processes side by side, then we can learn that control quality belongs to project quality management and validate scope is under project scope management. Whereas control quality is focused on correctness of the deliverables, validate scope is focused on acceptance of the deliverables. And lastly, control quality is usually performed by the quality control department and validate scope is performed by the customer or the sponsor. In the validate scope process, the project manager holds several meetings with the customer or the sponsor to review the deliverables to ensure that the deliverables are completed satisfactorily. In summary, Control quality is about ensuring that the deliverables meet the quality requirements defined in the quality management plan. Validate scope is about formalizing the acceptance of the deliverables. Furthermore, control quality is usually done before validate scope, but these processes can possibly be performed in parallel. Verified deliverables are an output of control quality and they are then an input to validate scope. We then take these verified deliverables in the process of validate scope and at the 
end of the process, they become the output called accepted deliverables. Both control quality and validate scope are performed as part of the monitoring and controlling process group. But validate scope can also be performed at the end of each project phase to validate the deliverables of each phase. Both control quality and validate scope processes can result in change request. Now let's talk about constraints for a minute. To do that, we also have to understand the concept of assumptions. Both assumptions and constraints are usually documented in your project management plan because they have such a great impact on the project. Constraints are different from assumptions. Assumptions are the factors in the planning process that are considered to be true, real or certain without proof or demonstration. A constraint on the other hand, is a limiting factor that affects the execution of a project, program, portfolio or process. And since we are talking about constraints, we have to mention the triple constraints and the three constraints that it contains. And we have to mention them here because you have to forget the triple constraints immediately because it is an outdated model. The traditional triple constraints of time, cost and scope is a metaphor that allows you to explain to someone who is new to project management that each constraint affects another. If you make a change to one, possibly both of the others will also be affected. However, nobody ever really agreed upon what these traditional constraints were. Some people even had four constraints. That is why the understanding grew that the traditional triple constraints concept uh, no longer represented real life project environments. Everybody knew that we had a multitude of constraints that affected each other and untold ways, but the image of these triple constraints was so ingrained in our teaching and thinking, we just kept using it. We have a multitude of constraints on a project, but in the end, the concept is a simple one. If you make a change to one area of your project, you will affect one or more of the others. So, Forget the triple constraint concepts and understand what is meant by the term competing project constraints because they represent what is really happening on all our projects. Here are some examples for you. So the skill level of our resources will affect quality. The better they are, the higher quality we can produce. Increasing our quality requirements will affect cost. We have to invest more time into delivering high quality products. If we cut our budget, that means we cannot hire skilled resources. If we have unskilled resources, that means it will affect our project schedule. It will most likely take much longer for us to finish this. And if we then cut our schedule back by two weeks, yes, that will lower our budget, but it will also affect our quality and resources. So as you can see, competing project constraints. One can affect one or many others. You also need to understand the purpose and content of the different scope related documents and there are many. For example, you have to know what the project scope statement is all about. You have to know the components of the scope baseline. You have to be able to list what the contents are of a scope management plan. And then we also have requirements based document, the requirements management plan, requirements traceability matrix and the requirements documentation. And by the way, when you look at the project scope statement, students often ask, you know, what's the relationship between the project charter and the scope statement? The best place to go for this is table 5-1 in the PIMBOK guide. This will help you understand the commonalities and differences between the project scope statement and the charter. When it comes to the tools and techniques, there are plenty. 
some of them you may be familiar with and some of them you may not be familiar with. Here's a list of them. So we have decomposition, expert judgment, benchmarking, group decision techniques, inspection, focus groups, as well as the variance analysis. Now, this is not an exhaustive or complete list. These are just the ones that we consider to be most important. Um, you know, you're required to study all the tools and techniques that are related to scope. However, we suggest you focus on this list here as well as any other tools and techniques that you may never have come across before. For example, most of us have probably asked a customer to fill out a questionnaire or a survey. So if you know what a questionnaire or a survey is, don't spend too much time on studying up on that. Instead, focus on another topic like what on earth is a group decision technique? Learn that. So study those totals and techniques that you are not familiar with. As part of your weekly workbook, we have included a description of the tools and techniques for the collect requirements process for your review. Let's review some of the ideas that we presented in this session. First, you should understand by now the importance of scope. How it is important to know and document what you are agreeing to do as part of your project. You will also know about the scope management plan. This plan documents the process to manage project scope and changes to the scope. Because once the scope is signed off, you need to follow a plan to change it. Otherwise, you'll have scope creep. This is, of course, what we know as change management. You should have a change management process on your project as soon as it is practical. It is best to be implemented when the scope baseline is improved. From that point on, all changes to the project scope should be authorized and tracked. Then we have the work breakdown structure, the WBS. It's one of the most important documents on your project. This is a deliverables oriented, hierarchically organized list of your project deliverables. It contains things, items, deliverables, results or products. So it talks about what we deliver, not how we deliver it. And of course, it contains 100% of the project's scope. Items at the lowest level of the WBS are called work packages. We will encounter these work packages again in project time management. That is where we will figure out how we will produce them. But here in the WBS, we still only talk about the what. The WBS is also the basis for making a bottom-up estimate. Later on in the time and cost management chapters, you will learn how the WBS is used to estimate how long each work package will take to complete and how much it will cost. And now it is once again time to take action. So print out your take action worksheet and start checking off the various tasks we have for you. In particular, I want you to, of course, primarily read the assigned chapters on scope management, both in the PIMBOK guide, as well as your separate PMP exam prep book. Then I have another reading assignment for you. It is an article about the work breakdown structure. It's titled Student Tips for Building a WBS that will both help your project and earn a good grade on a WBS assignment. And it was written by Kay Weiss from SuccessfulProjects.com. It's less than two pages long and contains many good tips on how to create a good WBS. And then, of course, take the self-assessment exam and answer sample exam questions in the weekly workbook. If you want to go beyond, I have a few listening assignments for you. The first two are about the work breakdown structure. Here we have episode 55 of the PMO podcast with Mark Price Perry, in which he promotes the simple 
WBS. He starts talking about the WBS about four minutes and 15 seconds into the program. So you can fast forward over everything before that. Then I also would like you to listen to Controlling Chaos, the Controlling Chaos podcast episode nine. Work breakdown structures with Dina, Henry Scott and Lee Scott and learn more about the importance of the WBS in Project Scope. And then we also have a podcast about ethics for you. This is the Project Management Podcast, episode number 169, uh, where Jeff Furman and myself uh, talk first about ethics in general, and then to he moves on also to ethics and legal aspects. And finally, we sort of carefully tread our way through a number of interesting ethical situations for you. Next, we have a video lesson from the PM Prepcast for you, finding the best answer to sample question. And this video is focusing on PMP exam sample questions. We look at the number of techniques that you can apply to narrow down your choices. Usually you should be able to take the four answers that you have and almost immediately eliminate two of the available options. So take a look at this video and learn more such techniques. And then you should also take a look at the weekly workbook. I already mentioned this one here, where we describe the different tools and techniques that you can use to collect requirements. Now, you don't have to use them all for your project, but you have all of these at your disposal and you can select the ones that are most appropriate for your project. So here you have all of them explained in plain language. I also want you to take a look at the rather extensive study boost section in the weekly workbook where I suggest a number of great ways how you can boost your studies beginning with a series of uh, I think almost 200 free sample exam questions that I created on various tools that you can sign up for. Then we have two PDF documents for you with both PMP and CAPM exam sample questions that come straight from PMI, but there are only very few of these sample questions. Still, these are the only official sample questions that PMI has ever published, and we got them for you. I also recommend that you join your local PMI chapter to meet others who are also studying for the PMP exam. Great way to reach out and find a study buddy. If you meet other PMP students, I want you to form a study group with them. You can meet weekly and study together. That way, it's not just you and me here. Instead, you have someone with exactly the same goal working with you. You will also find a link to a slide share presentation that contains 15 sample questions. It contains answers and explanations along with each question. You'll find the link, of course, in your weekly workbook in the Take Action Worksheet. That's a simple way in which you can apply what you have learned in the video from the PrepCast on how to find the correct answer uh, to a bunch of questions. But I also want you to be prepared for the fact that on your actual PMP exam, you will probably come across a question that will be virtually impossible to answer correctly. It's not just possible for any person to know it all. It's just not possible for any one of us to know everything. I would say uh, count on at least four to five questions, which after the exam you'll say, I really have absolutely no idea if I answered those correctly. PMI will, of course, never publish these questions and their answers. It's just you will get the feeling that something is just strange. I don't know what happened. And, but what I expect from you during the exam is that you are not shocked when you come across such a question. Realize that, well, this is probably one of those wild questions that Cornelius mentioned during one of the coaching sessions here. And then I want you to give this question your full attention. Give it the best you have. Attack it with logic and answer it using what you know from the PMBOK guide's point of view. With that, you can select the best answer among the four alternatives. 
My reminder for you today is a simple one. I really want you to take a day off every week from your studies. You need this time to get your mind off the exam and recharge your batteries. After all, this is not the 110 meter hurdle race. This is a 47k long marathon and we are just about beginning to warm up here. Have you decided yet? which day it is going to be. Maybe you have a family and so it would be a good idea to take Saturdays off to spend time with them. Or maybe you don't want to tie yourself down to a specific day and you decide ad hoc which day of the week you will take off. But no matter which format you follow, I want you to take a step back from your studies for one day every week and relax. In our exam tip, we're going to take a look at a few proven methods that everyone should follow when it comes to taking the PMP exam and answering questions. First of all, RTFQ. Read the full question. This is especially important when dealing with lengthy questions on the exam, which test your ability to concentrate and get to the important details of a scenario-based question in order to arrive at the correct answer. Often the gist of the question is in fact contained in the last sentence. If you are able to correctly read the question, you're already halfway there to answering it right. For instance, are they looking for the correct answer or maybe the best answer? Or do they want you to identify the incorrect alternative? If you have a question with a double negative, rephrase it to see if it makes more sense. Then second, RTFA. Obviously, read the full answer. A lot of questions have two answers that you can immediately eliminate. Then it's up to you to determine which of the remaining answer choices is the best answer. Even if the question is an easy one, make sure that you read all the four answer alternatives carefully so you can pick the right one. Then you also want to mark for review those difficult questions on your first pass that you're not quite sure about and review them later. This allows you to minimize frustration and take the question off your mind temporarily, but also to immediately answer the questions that you know the answers to, which may then give you confidence to go back and answer the more difficult questions. And lastly, it also allows you to answer other questions that may help you with the more difficult questions. You, of course, also want to constantly refer to your brain dump that you should have next to you by this time in the exam room. Quite a few questions on the PMP exam relate back to names of specific knowledge area, process groups and processes. Many times just by looking at your brain dump, you'll be able to determine which of the answer choices either do or do not fit into these categories. And please do remember that your first choice is normally correct. It's generally counterproductive to go back and change a lot of answer choices that you have made initially. Nine out of ten times, your first intuition on an answer choice is the best. Only change an answer if you are 100% certain that your original answer was incorrect and only based on additional information that you have gained while taking the exam. And finally, I have this for you as first said by Winston Churchill. It's not enough that we do our best. Sometimes we have to do what's required. Until next time.